Protection from COVID-19 vaccines help prevent serious illness and deaths in the older population, but it appears that death rate actually rose pretty sharply during the last Omicron wave. Joining us now, Dr. Abrar Karan, infectious disease specialist at Stanford Healthcare. Thanks so much for joining us to talk about this. Thanks for having me. So does this mean that Omicron could be more dangerous than initially thought? And could the new subvariants bring even more concern? We are seeing people test positive a lot more often now. Absolutely. Uh, you know, early on in an epidemic, you're always trying to figure out exactly how virulent um, a pathogen is, how much uh, mortality it causes. And it's hard to know those numbers early on. After a wave has passed and you look back and you break it down by age group and comorbidities and other things like that, you can then figure out and compare it to older um, variants. And so with Omicron, we actually found, you know, overall, we had more deaths than we did during Delta. Uh, part of that was because it uh, spread so quickly and um, spread to so many people. Um, but then beyond that, when we looked at data uh, for, for particular age groups, we found that actually Omicron did cause um, a lot of death, uh, even, even in terms of a proportion of that group. Um, part of this is because people's immunity also waned uh, since they got their last uh, vaccine dose. And that's going to be true even heading into the future with new variants. And speaking of vaccines, I've read that some researchers say that nasal vaccines could help prevent COVID infections by blocking those pathogens that get in through the nose. So could these vaccines potentially be more effective than the current shots, especially after what you just said that it's starting to wane off? Absolutely. And I think actually the key point here is that they may be much better at preventing infection altogether. So remember, when you're walking around in the environment, we're constantly exposed to pathogens in the air. And you need to get enough um, for it to overcome your immune responses and cause clinical infection. Now, as you know, it enter, uh, you know, COVID, uh, the COVID virus enters in through your nose, through your mouth, into your lungs. And essentially, if you can block that, if you can get good immunity right at the entry points, um, we're hoping that can prevent infection. And thereby, we won't see these huge surges that we're seeing. Remember, the vaccines that we have now do a very good job at preventing against severe disease and death and hospitalizations, but we need vaccines that actually prevent against infection altogether. So what does a nasal vaccine look like? So it, it essentially would be, um, you know, inhaled through the intranasal route um, and it would induce an immune response right, right there in your nose and your mucosa. Um, and that would be different than the vaccine that you get injected intramuscularly. Okay, so essentially it creates a wall right where COVID comes in. Yeah, exactly. So it's really hitting COVID, the you know, SARS-CoV-2 particles right at the right at the entry points. And so you want to get a good, robust immune response right there in your in your nasal mucosa and your oral mucosa and thereby prevent it from causing deeper seated infection in your lungs, um, which, you know, is why we see pneumonias and people end up hospitalized and on ventilators and whatnot. So we want people to have these immune responses start, uh, you know, right at the entry point, such that they don't get infected and don't keep spreading it on other people. And that's the key point here. We don't want this to keep spreading. Okay, and Dr. Karan, we saw a lot of hesitation with getting the COVID vaccine, like we do with a lot of vaccines. There's always gonna be that group that's a little bit nervous about it. What about any potential risks that could come from the nasal vaccine that people might be concerned about? Absolutely. You know, here again, we need to look at um, how people do in clinical trials, what kind of immune responses people have um, with any kind of vaccine. You know, there's going to be uh, an inflammatory response that some people have, and we need to monitor that just like we do for all vaccines. And remember, the comparison point here, though, is what happens if you don't get vaccinated and you instead get COVID, which we know induces a very, very intense immune response and can cause even worse effects. And so, you know, with the intranasal vaccines, they're still going through clinical trials right now. Um, and so we don't have data as, as of yet in terms of any big signals. But um, once we do, it'll be, you know, made available to the public. And although you just said that it is going through trials right now, any idea how long it could be before we see these nasal vaccines be available to the public? And would it be something where you get your normal shot in the arm and the nasal vaccine? It's a great question. I, I would expect sometime uh, heading into late this year or next year um, that we'll start to get more data on this and you know, hopefully get approval. Remember, some of these approvals get even expedited uh, depending on what we're dealing with, right? Uh, especially with the emergency use authorizations that we've seen, depending on how bad COVID gets, what variants we deal with, what kind of surges we're dealing with this winter. Now, in terms of would we get both, if clinical trials show that there's actually a big benefit to getting both, whereby you prevent infection and you prevent severe disease um, and hospitalizations, 
it's possible, but I'd say it's too early to say right now. Okay, and really, who knows where we're going to be in a couple months, too. Dr. Abrar Karan with Stanford Healthcare, thank you so much for your time and talking about this important issue. Thanks for having me.